I have finally done it. I have found the closest thing to the perfect camera and no one is talking about it. Surprisingly, this camera came out about a year ago. It has everything you could ask for from a camera and I don't care if you're a photographer or a videographer, but for those of us who fall somewhere in the middle, this camera is going to be something even more special. Now sure, it has a few cons as well, but with a camera as great as this, it's got one major hurdle that it has to cross and that's its price. But how do you justify the price of a camera? What makes it worth the price? Well, for me, there are three things that justify whether a camera is worth its price. It's the three C's. So let's see if the Canon R3 can live up to its $6,000 price tag. So stop me if I'm wrong, but as a creator, when we start to hear whispers of a new camera, the first thing we do is look to see what the specs and features are. If you also ask us, are specs the most important things? We'll say no, but we can't help but want to know. And the reason this is so important to us is because knowing the specs helps us understand the first C, creative possibilities. If you've been shooting photos or videos for a bit, you can typically look at a camera's spec sheet and have a good idea of what you can and cannot do with the camera. So let's break this down with the Canon R3. At a $6,000 price point, you would expect this camera to not only deliver on specs and features, but to excel. And there are a few ways that this camera does this. Last week, I took this camera out to shoot a local high school rivalry football game. And this is Texas, so we go big for football games. I also wanted to let my good friend Doug Brown, who is a professional sports photographer, take the R3 out for a spin. While out on the field, it became apparent that this camera was not pulling any punches. You would expect great autofocus from a modern camera. So how does the R3 one-up the autofocus game? By literally letting you control your autofocusing area just by looking where you want to focus. The easiest way to explain this is there's a little yellow circle and as you look to different areas of the actual frame, your focus area moves there, but then the camera, understanding that it's probably a lot better than we are, knows how to then detect the area that needs to be focused on, like faces and people and subjects. Shooting on the field was an amazing experience. I took the opportunity to test out a few of the video features as well. I was incredibly impressed with how clean the shadows were. Also, I was fairly surprised with how good the autofocus was even when it couldn't detect a face. This was also the first time I tested out the 6K raw video shooting and I thought the images looked very sharp, but I don't know if it was wildly better than the 4K. So unless you're gonna need room to like reframe and crop your image, I think 4K is gonna be more than enough, but also it gives you the option of 120 frames per second. Doug and I switched back and forth with the camera throughout the entire night. And this is where a big issue started to pop up for me. See, I own the Canon R5C, which is supposed to be Canon's true hybrid camera. But whenever I was filming and taking pictures with the R3, it felt like it was more suited to be the hybrid. It switches from photo to video in no time. And please don't get me started on the battery life. Although I was there to test out the R3, I started to wonder, should I have chosen the R3 over my R5C? We wrapped up the night feeling pretty positive about the R3's capabilities, but sure, for $6,000, the camera should be pretty capable. Bonus features such as 30 frames per second for photos definitely came in handy when shooting the fast paced football game. And the battery life on this camera lasted all night, which was a major plus as I actually only had one battery. <laughs> With a camera as stacked as this one, it's really hard to think of a project that it couldn't handle. That being said, just because this camera has great specs doesn't mean they can just charge whatever they want for it. So sure, it checked the box for the first C, but as far as I'm concerned, it's the second C that really causes a lot of cameras to fail the value evaluation process, at least for me. 
The following day after shooting the football game, I took the R3 to go shoot a CrossFit competition. Now, shooting CrossFit competitions is kind of like shooting football, except the lighting is pretty much way worse. And overall, it's just much harder to predict what's gonna happen when filming. So in my case, this was also a client job. So to say I had to nail the shots is pretty much a given. For the project, I was responsible for shooting both photos and video. I hired out my good friend Marcus to help with some of the video coverage, and he bought out his C70, which was nice because this meant that in the edit, I was able to see how this camera looked side by side and if they could work well together. Now, I typically never recommend taking a fairly new camera out to shoot a client project, but I have also discovered that when I have to rely on a camera is when I'm really able to start to see some of its weak areas. Finding the weak areas of a camera is extremely important, and that is why it's the second C, creative limitations. Okay, I get it. The first C was technically creative possibilities, and the second C is creative limitations, which they both are technically the same word, but you'll understand why I did that when I get to the third C. Now, understanding what you can get out of a camera is important, but knowing what you can't get out of the camera, I think is equally as important. Now, sure, the R3 is great, but there were a few issues I found from the camera. For starters, I mentioned that the CrossFit competition has fairly bad lighting. So I got some video shots in RAW when the lighting was very bad. And I figured out that even with the Final Cut plugin installed, you don't actually get full RAW editing control. That said, editing the footage in Final Cut Pro was still a fairly easy process, and I was surprised with how much dynamic range the camera still had. I edited the footage using a plugin from today's video sponsor, Cinemagrade. The Canon R3 has recording modes from 8-bit to 12-bit. When I was working with the 12-bit footage in Cinemagrade, it allows you to just click on an area of the footage and make adjustments. If you wanna bring up your midtones, you just simply click in that area and you just make that adjustment by sliding. This allowed me to see how far I could actually push the grade when editing. I could also test the color information by clicking and making an adjustment to the hues and the saturation levels of a shot. I found that the 10-bit and 12-bit shots both stored plenty of data, allowing me to be more creative with my grade. Cinema Grade has a feature called shot matching, which made it easier for me to get the same look across different clips. And I found that it doesn't matter if the clip was a 10-bit or 12-bit clip, they equally colored great. Coloring the R3 footage with Cinema Grade was very easy, and it has become my new way of coloring all of my footage in Final Cut Pro. CinemaGrade is also available in Premiere and DaVinci, so as I continue my education into DaVinci, it's nice to know that these coloring techniques will be able to move with me there. As someone who doesn't love color grading or the process, but enjoys a well-polished finished look, I will say that this plugin with this point and click drag system, the shot matching system, and the LUT previewer makes the editing process go by much faster. Check out the links in the description if you wanna check out Cinema Grade for yourself. And if you do so within the first 30 days of this video being published, you can actually get an additional 20% off. Now, one really unique feature that this camera has is something called anti-flickering, which will allow it to look for flickering lighting sources in your frame and then adjust the shutter to compensate to eliminate the flickering. This feature, as far as I'm concerned, is groundbreaking, especially as we get closer to the holidays, because it can make adjustments at a micro level. So you can shoot at a 50.8 frames per second in order to eliminate those flickering lights. However, I found that the auto mode didn't really do that great of a job, especially when there were multiple lights in the frame. But when I manually adjusted it, it worked out great. I think another limitation for some people with this camera is gonna be the overall size of it. It's obviously larger than most mirrorless cameras today. Now, when it comes to the vertical grip on this camera, it feels amazing. I honestly prefer using this camera in the portrait orientation over landscape. That said, despite its size, it's still surprisingly light. I was able to carry this camera, a full set of lenses, a gimbal, all inside of this companion element camera bag. And it didn't feel heavy at all. Now, granted, this bag is super comfortable, especially because it has the waist belt. Now, 
Full disclosure, they did send me this bag, but it was perfect timing because it has a slightly deeper design to hold pro body cameras or cameras with battery grips. It also has this cool roll top section so you can store extra things in there like snacks. Now how these limitations affect you will change from person to person. For example, all of those limitations for me are minor annoyances at most. Actually the biggest limitation for me is the fact that the quarter inch thread on the bottom is not centered with the camera. Now it is rightfully under the lens mount but I really wish it was centered because this means that certain L brackets can only be used one way, which in my case, ugh, it's, a, it's a massive inconvenience. Like for example, I would much rather it block the dual card slots, which I hardly will need to change in the middle of a shoot, especially when I'm shooting vertically. I, I mean, especially like one of my biggest issues is when I'm shooting vertically for myself, I can't even flip the screen up in order to see myself. Now again, these creative limitations for me are minor inconveniences at most, but they might go further for you. But for me, this means that the camera has now officially checked two of the boxes when it comes to the three C's. So the last C, as far as I'm concerned, could be the most important for all creatives. We have all either faced or will face creative fatigue. It is the moment when you should be creating, but you can't bring yourself to do it. So you go looking for inspiration. Now, if you're like me, you can find this in music or cartoons, but one area that I think is overlooked when it comes to finding inspiration is it's in the creative tools themselves. I can't tell you how many times I've just gone out with a camera and just shot some stuff for the joy of it. Just playing with one of my toys. <laughs> That's kind of what my wife calls all my cameras. I know this is a bit of a hot take, but I don't think you have to have a logical reason to buy a camera. The same way people spend money on purses or lifted trucks, remember I'm in Texas, and other hobbies, I think as a creator, it's okay to buy something just because you want it and it's going to inspire you creatively. And that's the third C, creative inspiration. I know, I know all the three C's were creative, but what was I supposed to call them? The PLIs? Like that doesn't sound good. When it comes to determining if a camera is worth the price, I think one of the best, if not the most important attribute is does this camera inspire me to wanna go out and shoot with it? I have been blessed to have had the opportunity to shoot with a lot, and I mean a lot of different cameras in my career, but not all of them, like they don't all spark joy when I'm using them. I think this is my problem with my R5C. By all standards I have talked about, it does a great job because, because of the battery life, it just doesn't spark joy for me when I use it. Now I get it, you could have a completely different idea to me, but this is just my personal hot take. Shooting with the R3, it sparks joy. Now sure, it may be all just nostalgia. Shooting with this camera takes me back to my 1DX Mark II days when life was simple, when I was just a wide-eyed creator, not worrying about making payroll or hitting 100,000 subscribers. <clears throat> By the way, did you click the button? The real joy is working with this camera. It's a lot like my Red V Raptor. Now, I know, I know, another high dollar camera, but they both have this way of bringing me joy when I'm using them. Now, as a contrast, I shot with the Alexa Mini LF a few months ago, a camera that I only dreamed I'd be able to shoot with, and it actually cost way more than my Raptor. But when filming with it, I didn't get that same feeling. So I don't really think it's tied to price because crazy enough, I do get that same spark of joy when I'm filming or shooting with my iPhone. Now, sure, the R3 has all the bells and whistles, but for $6,000, it should. And the footage looks great, the photos are fantastic, and the photo mechanics are astounding. But for me, what makes this camera worth the price is how I feel when I use it. Now, this doesn't mean that this will be my last camera to ever make me feel this way. But for now, I can say that it is time for me to switch to the R3. My opinions on the R5C have not changed. It's a great camera, but I can only justifiably own one of them. And if I have to choose between one or the other, I'm gonna go with the R3. Now, if you haven't yet, 
definitely hit that subscribe button because congratulations, you made it to the end of the video. But before you go, be sure to check out this video right over here because this is the video that YouTube thinks is going to change your life forever.